biographies of Immanuel Kant and Thomas Aquinas. We're going to note their similarities and some of their key differences uh, for today. One of the most towering figures of philosophy in the modern period was Immanuel Kant, who said of his own philosophy in the prolegomena to any future metaphysics that to evade it is impossible. As it turns out, Kant was right in recognizing the dominant force of his philosophical project and that it would have in shaping the discipline of philosophy, so much so that later thinkers have had no choice but to reject, accept, or modify his terms and ideas. The one thing that he, they have not been able to do is to evade it. And this is evident in theological circles in the 20th century, especially within Protestantism, Karl Barth's uh, radical orthodoxy, uh, also within Thomistic circles in the Catholic Church, uh, Transcendental Thomism with Karl Rahner, and in the contemporary scene, Reformed Postmodernism represented by James K. Smith. All of these Christian figures, theology, and thought is rooted in a Kantian understanding of epistemology. So we are going to look at his uh, philosophy and its roots and contrast this with a pre-modern uh, scholastic position with that of Thomas Aquinas. Kant's objective for his critical philosophy was to provide a proper scientific basis for metaphysics, just as Newtonian science has provided a uh, basis for modern science. Yet, Newt Newtonian science assumes that the laws which govern the world are universal, necessary, and objective. Kant agreed with these aims and wanted to provide a metaphysical basis for the sciences. Kant's thought became uh, uh, known as a Copernican revolution within philosophy. Just as Copernicus had shown that the earth actually moves around the sun and not the sun around the earth, Kant wanted to show that our knowledge does not conform to objects, but objects conform to our knowledge. This is a key idea for Kant. This was how Kant was going to establish metaphysics as a science which views knowledge as universal and objective and how he was going to ultimately have a revolutionary or novel epistemology. Uh, Kant is working within a couple frameworks. First, he's working within the framework set down by Rene Descartes in the birth of the epistemological problem. Descartes, as we know, wanted to doubt all of his senses in order to find something that could not be doubted. And what he came up with was the cogitare ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. This is something that cannot be doubted. It's undoubtable because even if I am doubting, there must be a me there who is doing the doubting, who is doing the thinking. And so I must be a thinking thing. This led to the mind-body dualism. If I am a thinking thing and all I know is my thoughts, then I don't really know for sure that I have a body and I have senses. If all I have access to is the inner thoughts of my own mind, then how do I have certain knowledge if my thoughts rightly and accurately correspond to the external world? This is known as the epistemological problem, the problem of the inner and the outer experience and how they can correspond to one another. Descartes using the rationalist principle that all of our knowledge begins with reason. And Kant is also working within another framework, that of the skeptical empiricism of David Hume and his famous problem of causation. Uh, he is working within this framework by David Hume, but he's trying to redeem the role of reason within. Contrary to rationalists like Descartes, empiricists like Hume held that all of our knowledge begins with experience. Kant acknowledged that our knowledge begins with experience, but also affirms that some of our knowledge can be attained through reason alone, a priori. Kant's two sources of knowledge, a priori and a posteriori, uh, correspond to Hume's own view that there are only two categories of knowledge, matters of fact, which are drawn from experience, and then relations of ideas, which are just drawn analytically from reason. These two modes of knowledge constitute Hume's fork, because relations of ideas and matters of fact are distinct and separate from each other. These synthetic a posteriori and analytic a priori modes of knowledge do not mix and cannot be combined, just as the prongs on two forks do not mix or touch. So the purpose of Hume's fork is to clarify the basis of all of our claims to knowledge and to exclude any forms of knowledge that fall outside the grasp of this fork. Such topics that would fall outside of the fork would be traditional metaphysics, human freedom, the soul, cause and effect, miracles, and especially God. Right? We can't see any of those things in experience, 
and they aren't uh, relations of ideas. And so Kant famously concludes his essay on epistemology by saying, quote, if we take in our hand any volume of divinity or school metaphysics, for instance, let us ask, does it contain any abstract reasoning concerning quality, quantity, or number? No. Does it contain any experiential reasoning concerning matters of fact and experience? No. Then commit it to the flames, for it contains nothing but sophistry and illusion. End quote. So, a major consequence of Hume's fork was to dethrone metaphysics as first philosophy, to delegitimate it as a science, which makes epistemology the first task of serious uh, philosophy. This goes hand in hand with Descartes. And Kant, a former rationalist under the influence of Descartes, was surprised by this devastating critique of metaphysics by Hume's empiricist philosophy. He writes, I openly confess that remembering David Hume was the very thing which many years ago first interrupted my dogmatic slumber and gave my investigations in the field of speculative philosophy a quite new direction. This reawakening to philosophy for Kant was a commitment to empiricism's principles, but with an infusion of rationalism to maintain metaphysics as a science. For all of Hume's brilliance, Kant found his empiricist project to end in skepticism, without any kind of metaphysical basis. And Hume went too far in giving up on metaphysics, because metaphysics is required if we want to maintain any rational foundation for things such as human freedom, the soul, understanding the world as a whole, uh, and God himself. Simply put, Kant tried in novel ways to be a disciple of Hume while still remaining a metaphysician. Key to Kant's project of establishing metaphysics as a science is the notion of the synthetic a priori. What is the synthetic a priori? Well, Anthony Kenny has a very helpful classification of Kant's project, one which is log logical and the other which is epistemological. Within the logical, there are two kinds of judgments, analytic and synthetic. Analytic judgments express nothing in the predicate but that which is already actually thought in the concept of the subject, such as all bodies are extended. Synthetic judgments, on the other hand, do contain in its predicate something not actually thought in the universal concept of body. In short, synthetic judgments add to our knowledge, while analytic judgments are necessary a priori from reason, and a posteriori are necessarily synthetic. Uh, while he said that, there are some judgments Kant concludes that can be combined. The synthetic a priori. Mathematical judgments such as 7 plus 5 equals 12 are Kant's examples of such synthetic a priori judgments. By establishing this new category of knowledge, the synthetic a priori, Kant has overcome the false dichotomy of Hume's fork, claiming that all, not all of our knowledge claims are either matters of fact or relations of idea, ideas. This enabled Kant to provide a scientific basis for metaphysical claims that had previously been rejected by Kant. Kant acknowledges the fact that the establishment of metaphysics as a science stands or falls on the possibility of synthetic a priori statements, and that all metaphysicians are legally suspended until they have satisfactorily answered the question, how are synthetic cognitions a priori possible? The answer for Kant is that synthetic cognitions a priori are possible because our minds are structured to impose on the world certain forms and categories. Our minds are not passive receptacles of knowledge of things in the world, contrary to John Locke's tabula rasa, but rather they are active agents in constituting the world as intelligible. For instance, in answering the question, how is mathematics possible? Kant writes in the Prolegomena to Any Future Metaphysics that mathematics is possible because of prior notions of space and time, which are not things or objects in and of themselves, but modes of representation that the mind needs to make sense of the world and imposes upon the world. If Kant has successfully overcome Hume's fork by establishing this third category, the synthetic a priori, how does it enable him to overcome Hume's denial of causation? He concedes with Hume that there is no strict empirical basis for cause and effect. However, his solution to Hume's skepticism is that pure concepts of understanding such as cause and effect are not derived from experience, but experience is derived from them. In other words, causation is not a thing in the empirical world that we perceive, but rather an idea of reason. It regulates our experience, for without it we could not make sense of the world. 
Thus, this critical philosophy or transcendental idealism of Kant maintains that metaphysical notions such as the soul and the world as the whole, freedom, God, cannot be known uh, because we cannot prove their existence empirically or rationally. But because they are necessary modes of thought for us to make sense of the world, in other words, we couldn't make sense of the world without them, we must posit that they exist. But we can't know anything about them other than they exist, Kant said. Kant's overcoming of Hume's skepticism thus comes at a very high price, for it argues that we can never know reality, that is, things in themselves. We can never know the noumena. We can only know things as they appear to us. The success of Kant's reformulation of metaphysics as a science is dependent upon the plausibility of these empiricist enterprise as a whole. So since Kant is trying to redeem metaphysics from the skeptical results of strict empiricism and provide it with a scientific basis, he has to first work within this epistemological framework of that tradition. That again says that we don't know things in and of themselves, the noumena, we can only know things as they appear to us. So the perceiver never comes in contact with the object, only the object as it is perceived. Now, there are some implications of Kant's thought that come from Descartes and Hume. And one of them is that the inner world, that, the, that is, the mind, the thought, the idea, is actually better known than the outer world, uh, the world of physicality, the world of senses, the world, the real world that we all kind of know or as plain persons. And that outer substances are inferred from inner experience. And for Kant, the inner world, the phenomena, is dependent upon this assumption that there is an actual objective external world, the noumena, we just can't know anything about it. So it is fundamental to Kant's claim that while he is a transcendental idealist, he is at an empirical level a realist and not an idealist like Ber Berkeley, according to Anthony Kennedy, the Oxford scholar. All right, some critical problems for Kant. Number one, if we perceive the world uh, as a creation of the mind, then how can we have any real knowledge of the external world? This is a uh, big problem for Kant that is not really solved. And another question uh, for Kant is that, is metaphysics best characterized as the study of objects beyond experience? And does Kant's metaphysics assume that being is a univocal term? And we're going to contrast this with Thomas Aquinas, who's going to not view metaphysics as viewing being as univocal, but as analogical. So let's take a look now at the scholastic epistemological approach and so we can have a better clarity on how this is different from Kant's modern approach. Characteristics of the scholastic epistemology is that it's working within the tradition of Plato and Aristotle's philosophy. Plato taught that nature makes nothing in vain and that all men by nature desire to know, so men must have the capacity to know truth. In other words, Scholastic epistemology is an anti-skeptical, an anti-relativism, and an anti-sophist epistemology. It assumes that truth exists, that we do not invent the truth, but that we discover it, and humans are capable of knowing the truth. And so this kind of skepticism that we don't know or can't know the truth is really a false humility from a scholastic point of view. But this uh, assumes that we can really know essences, and this is part of the debate between Aquinas and Kant, is can we know essences of things? Uh, Kenneth T. Gallagher, a philosopher, former philosopher at Fordham University, says that for scholastic philosophers, uh, we have knowledge of essence, and this kind of reinforces this belief that through concepts we know things exactly as they are in themselves. Well, why, do, why did the scholastics kind of believe this? And this is the world that Thomas Aquinas inherits. Well, there are four reasons. One, that the senses only give us partial knowledge, whereas the intellect can give us the nature of things. And that, number two, the insistence of defining terms. The fact that having a correct definition of something, getting at the essence or the nature of the thing, is to know that thing. So to define or to know is to define. And third, essence of the source is the source of intelligibility, whereas existence is indefinable. And lastly, knowledge is interlocking, objective, and transmittable in definitions that perfectly capture experience. Kenneth T. Gallagher at Fordham University uh, calls this into question and says that the scholastic position is perhaps overstated. Perhaps truth seems to lie in the other direction. While essences are needed for intelligibility, he writes, we should be modest and not claim that our definitions contain the essence of a thing. Since our knowledge of the thing is first derived from our senses, not our reason, there is a temptation to try to go beyond 
uh, our claims to know the essence of things than our senses will allow. So let's take a look now to uh, Aquinas So, because we saw some criticisms of this. For Thomas Aquinas' epistemology, philosophy as a whole, as an enterprise, must not first start with epistemology. It must first start with metaphysics. And this is a very key idea for Thomism. Uh, and especially philosophical under, uh, anthropology. We must understand that being exists, that we exist first in the world, and that we come to know the world only after we recognize that it exists. And it also assumes that man is a unity of body and soul, not a soul trapped in a body. And because we are a body and a soul, our bodies can come to know things about the world through our senses. So according to Aquinas, all knowledge of the human person starts with the senses. So, how do we arrive at knowledge for Thomas Aquinas? Number one, our knowledge begins with experience. He writes, nothing is in the intellect that was not first in the senses. So, the senses are the foundation. And it's uh, these senses that uh, experience is able to understand. Number two, experience is potentially intelligible. That is, sense images produced uh, reproduces the thing itself in the mind for the mind, the intellect, to understand. And number three, the intellect actively makes intelligible sense experience. This is what he calls the active agent. The intellect abstracts the thing from the sense uh, image that the perception gets and gets a universal. So universals aren't things floating around in the world. They are just abstractions from particular things in the concrete world. And number four, the intellect can know the truth, but it can know the truth uh, partially and not comprehending all things because it is finite. It does not have a God's eye point of view. So the Thomas position would push back a little bit on Gallagher's reading of scholastic metaphysics and say, no, 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 no. Scholastics don't say that we can know being exhaustively because that would assume a univocal conception of being and not an analogical one. And fifthly, um, finally, human reason is a participation in the divine light. God has structured the human mind and the world to know truth, and by knowing truth, we know God. What are some problems with a Kantian epistemology? Well, Etienne Gilson, a very famous Thomist in the beginning of the 20th century, says that when idealism begins with thought rather than being, uh, which it always does, it is doomed to the fate of suicide because it can never get outside the mind and move to reality itself. Philosophy, he says, cannot start with the epistemological question, how do I know the external world is real? It can't be preoccupied with certain proof or this problem of the external world. Otherwise, it will eventually just lead to skepticism, relativism, and contradictions. Philosophy, he says, must first start with metaphysics, with being, with sense experience, in order to arrive at reality and truth. Because if there's no thing, then there can be no knowledge of that thing. Makes pretty uh, much sense, which is why Thomas Aquinas' epistemology is called a common sense approach to knowledge. But let's look at some of the similarities between Kant and Aquinas. Anthony Kenny argues that Kant is closer to Aquinas than we might realize. In fact, he's closer to Aquinas than he is to Berkeley. Uh, Berkeley's notion of empiricism just leads into idealism, and, and Kant doesn't go that far. And neither is he close to Descartes' rationalism, leading to a form of realism. So where do they agree? Well, Kant and Aquinas agree that knowledge is only possible through a cooperation between the senses and the intellect. And for Aquinas, as for Kant, concepts without experience are empty, and phantasms without concepts are unintelligible. So, Kant and Aquinas largely have the same answer to the question, how do we acquire knowledge, both through the reason and through senses, but their differences lie with their answers to the question, can we know something at all? And this is uh, really foundational for their, based on their metaphysical assumptions. The key differences between Kant and Aquinas, the fundamental question that divides them is this question, do our senses lead us to reality as it really is? For Kant, no, our senses only lead us to things as they appear to us, not things in themselves, the noumena. It only leads us to the phenomena. For Aquinas, yes, our senses do lead us to reality as it really is because there is no distinction between the things as they appear to us and the things in themselves. That's a false dichotomy, a false distinction. So let's look at this little chart comparing the critical tradition of Kant versus the non-critical tradition of Aquinas. The starting point for Kant is thought with the self with the mind. 
The starting point for Aquinas is being with the other, with things, that we only know ourselves reflexively through knowing another. Kant's rooted in the Cartesian understanding, I think, therefore I am, whereas Aquinas is rooted in the understanding that things exist, therefore I know, therefore I am a knowing subject. So this is a quote from Gilson. The first principle for Kant is that thought is, whereas the first principle for Aquinas is that being is. The method of Kant on Hume and Descartes is that we should doubt our senses. The, uh, the method for Aquinas is that we need to trust the senses because they lead us to reality. The goal for Kant is absolute certainty, where the goal for Aquinas is reality. The first task thus for uh, p philosophy according to Kant is epistemology, where the first task of philosophy according to Aquinas is metaphysics. The progression of thought, mind to reality for Kant, whereas reality to mind for Aquinas. Uh, philosophical anthropology, Kant really and uh, Descartes kind of assume that mind is really a man is really two things, a soul and a body. This is kind of a platonic understanding, where Aquinas has a notion much more uh, integral, uh, going to Aristotle, and this, the Aristotelian tradition, that man is really one thing. Uh, the soul is the form of the body. The man is an embodied soul. And so we need sensation to uh, get us to the truth. Moving on to reality, Kant has this metaphysical distinction between the noumena and the phenomena. We only know things in themselves, or we don't know things in themselves, rather. We only know things as they appear to us. For Aquinas, there's no such thing as the noumena. This is silly. We just know the things, right? Uh, yeah, as they appear to us, but we still know the things. And so the underlying key assumption there is for Kant, being is unintelligible. It doesn't make sense. We have to impose these things, uh, whereas for Aquinas, being the world uh, is intelligible because it's a participation in divine reason. So for Kant, the philosopher invents truth, right? The mind is active imposing these things upon the, uh, the world. For Aquinas, the philosopher discovers truth. And these are some of the broad distinctions between Immanuel Kant's epistemology and Thomas Aquinas. I hope you found this short little video helpful. Uh, these are some sources that I used for this presentation that you might want to check out uh, for further reading. Have a wonderful day.